Welcome everyone to ACU's summit and to this pathway, peacemaking across the Christian Muslim divide. We're thankful for, that you were able to join us today and I hope that this conversation will be a blessing to you. So we're excited about this pathway uh, at ACU Summit. Uh, we have five sessions that we will be hosting for you, uh, talking about peacemaking across the Christian Muslim divide. Um, four of those sessions, starting with today's, um, will be uh, conversations, will be dialogues um, between a Muslim and a Christian um, in various contexts around the world and varying relationships. Um, but we hope that these conversations uh, will be enlightening to you and that they will help you better understand what peacemaking is, better understand um, the relationship between Christians and Muslims, and most of all, how to love um, our neighbor who is uh, different than us religiously. Um, the fifth session will be uh, an opportunity for us to reflect on what does this mean for the church? How, how do we engage in peacemaking? How do we engage in interreligious dialogue? Um, how do we uh, be good neighbors uh, to those near and far? Um, and so uh, to, before we get started with uh, today's presentation and introductions to our uh, speakers, um, I want to frame our conversation with um, a quote from this book, who actually one of the, the author is one of our presenters today. So if you can see that, I highly encourage you to, to go out and, <laughs> and uh, grab this great book here. Um, but in the introduction, um, Dr. Martin Akkad, he, he says uh, two things about um, peacemaking and religious, uh, in, interreligious engagement that I think are, are framing our conversation. One is, he says, it, it has to be about relationships that um, it has to be spending time with people and engaging um, with them around the table and in service together. And when you have those types of relationships, good things happen. It can't just be done at a theoretical level. And so we wanted to facilitate an opportunity for relationships to happen. While it'd been nice to be able to do this in person, we're gonna do this virtually, um, but still trying to cultivate a sense of relationship and dialogue and listening to one another. Um, but he also says in here, um, that speaking from a Christian perspective, that your view of Islam affects your attitude to Muslims. Your attitude in turn influences your approach to Christian Muslim interaction, and that approach affects the ultimate outcome of your presence as a witness among Muslims. And so we do want to learn and we want to understand better. Um, we want to better understand Islam and we hope that Muslims will better understand Christianity so that then the engagement can be more fruitful. And so this is both about uh, relationship and listening and dialogue and also increasing our understanding. So we hope that the, the dialogue today and in the sessions to come will be a blessing to you and that they will uh, shape you to be uh, the kind of neighbor that God calls us to be. I'm gonna turn it over now to Gary Bailey, um, who is the other co-host and I'm Darren Reese, by the way, I did not introduce myself, um, but I do work at Abilene Christian University and um, Gary Bailey does as well. And so we are uh, the host of this pathway. So we'll be with you um, all five sessions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gary to introduce our session and our presenters. Thank you, Darren. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm so glad to be doing this. This is a, a great opportunity for us to learn and expand our thinking. And and I'm grateful, Darren, for working with you in this in a collaborative way. And this is a, a, a number of things that we've done together. And I think uh, it's uh, made me a better person for engaging in these activities. And, and also thanks to the, the summit leaders and uh, programmers and all the work that uh, is done by the, the summit organizers in uh, putting this on as well as so many good uh, sessions. Uh, we're excited about this conversation and uh, we, we just let me tell you a little bit about how we're going to do this this is going to be really conversational if you've been a regular summit attender uh, you're probably used to hearing speeches and uh, this one won't be very speech like it will be very conversation like and uh, so but we're not we're going to try to not go terribly long uh, so we can save some questions some time for questions, 
So if you do have questions, be sure to put those in the chat. And uh, in a few minutes uh, after our conversation with our presenters, uh, Darren will come back and, and lead us through some of those uh, questions that you've posted. So uh, be listening and thinking about what questions you have and uh, share those questions with us. We, we're very interested in what uh, you might want to learn from our, our guests today. Now for this session. Uh, this session is uh, kind of focused, uh, the, the key word is charismatic peace building. And we're going to hear a little bit about that, I'm sure. Martin likes to talk about that. And so Martin has been uh, leading uh, in peacemaking initiatives in Lebanon for years, and he's going to talk about uh, his work in peace building and some of the work that he's done with Sheikh Mohammed. And uh, so they, this is going to be a good opportunity for us to see how people in Lebanon, our peace building partners in Lebanon, uh, work with their neighbors of other faiths, all in the pursuit of faith. And uh, so we want to uh, welcome our uh, our presenters. And let me just introduce you briefly. And I know as we get into our questions, uh, you can introduce yourself more in more detail uh, as you talk about your relationship. But um, Sheikh Mohammed is uh, the, a senior judge in the family court in, uh, in Lebanon. And since 07, he has been a lecturer at Jinan University in a contemporary Islamic thoughts and comparative religion. So he's well-versed and able to talk about interfaith kinds of issues and uh, works with uh, family law and uh, very interested in uh, activist works and uh, with peace building initiatives concerning culture, education, development, and all those kinds of good things related to peace and reconciliation. So we welcome you, uh, Mohammed, and uh, also Martin. Uh, he is the chief academic officer at Arab Baptist Theological Seminary in Beirut, uh, Lebanon. And he's uh, been working especially with the Institute of Middle East Studies. And uh, he's uh, well published. Uh, obviously, we saw a picture of his book. And uh, it's, let me say, it's a bit of a challenging read, but very worth your while. Uh, he goes into good depth about uh, some important things related to how we should be thinking about other faiths. Uh, as we try to, to live out our faith in very uh, serious and, and uh, committed ways. Uh, so we're going to engage in this conversation and uh, want to be uh, mindful of our time. So in the next 20 minutes or so, we'll have this conversation, 25 minutes, however long it takes. But uh, then we want to move to our, uh, our question and answers. So. Uh, Martin, let's begin with you. Why don't you begin uh, telling us a little bit about the nature of your relationship and uh, how, how you got to meet Sheikh Mohammed and, uh, and where you are today in your relationship. And, and Sheikh, you can, uh, as you disagree or agree with Martin, you can jump right in. Sheikh Mohammed never disagrees with me. Um, <laughs> I want to greet everyone who is uh, on this uh, webinar, uh, some of uh, the people I know and some I don't. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and I thank our hosts and the organizers of this, uh, uh, this series. Um, uh, Sheikh Mohammed and I uh, developed uh, a friendship uh, about probably we, we've known each other for about 15 years now. We've been friends uh, as uh, we, we were introduced by a common friend and uh, uh, we gradually uh, grew in, uh, in our uh, um, uh, understanding of each other, in our friendship, in our trust uh, toward each other. Um, and we've been involved in uh, all sorts of activities uh, since then. Uh, it started uh, probably with a couple of invitations for Sheikh Mohammed to come and speak at uh, events that we were organizing at the seminary and then uh, uh, I, I never teach a class anymore in Islamic studies without taking my class to, uh, to the mosque one Friday. And usually it's the mosque where Sheikh Muhammad is uh, giving his sermon that Friday and, uh, and leading prayer. And so uh, we, uh, uh, over the years, I've introduced Sheikh Muhammad to all sorts of friends and students and colleagues uh, and guests that come to Lebanon. 
we've also had uh, a few more formal uh, uh, partnerships and initiatives. Uh, our Institute of Middle East Studies uh, has peace building activities with young people, but also with uh, communities of faith and churches and mosques. And uh, uh, Sheikh Muhammad is, uh, although he's not the only uh, Muslim cleric that uh, I uh, count as a friend in my network, he's uh, my, uh, the first person I would go to uh, for, uh, for uh, that sort of activities because of the uh, long relationship and, and trust that exists between us. Um, and we've uh, been involved, uh, the most recent activity probably has been this uh, initiative of uh, forming small um, groups within churches and mosques who uh, get together and we moderate conversations about, uh, uh, about faith issues in order to grow trust between our places of worship and members in our places of worship who can then influence uh, the broader community of faith and then impact society around them. But Sheikh Mohammed and I have also traveled together uh, at other, play, other conferences and uh, so We've, we've had both formal and informal uh, opportunities to interact, and that's uh, the foundation of, uh, of a good friendship, I would say. So Sheikh Mohammed, is, uh, did he get it right? Or um, what would you add to that? What brought you to a friendship with uh, Martin? Uh, actually, it did not start as a friendship. It started as a, a request from uh, Tawakkad, he wanted me to be a speaker at one of uh, the conferences he was organizing at ABTS. And it was a very formal uh, thing to me at that time, 15 years ago. Then it was not some friend that I'm uh, going to visit. No, it was a conference that I need to speak and to be uh, very formal in my speech and to try to maybe uh, give the uh, best picture about uh, a Muslim cleric visiting a Christian uh, seminary and also to be able to reach the minds and the hearts of the uh, attendees. It was a challenge in that time. Uh, by the way, uh, in my education as a sheikh, as an imam, we never uh, uh, took any kind of uh, uh, training about uh, speaking with Christians, about visiting Christians, about uh, preaching or giving speeches in front of a Christian uh, audience. Then to me, it was really a challenge to, to show the best that I can show. But with time, it became less formal, more personal, more human, more uh, intimate, more uh, casual. And uh, th all through the 15 years I've been knowing uh, Dr. Aqad, as he mentioned, we went in different uh, experiences, uh, the formal thing, the academic thing, and even, uh, as I mentioned, the, the friendship, not only between me and him as individuals, but also the families, my wife and his wife, the children. And I can say that uh, Dr. Aqad added a lot of things to my experience and also to my personal life. Very good. Uh, so and since uh, Dr. Aqad uh, mentioned uh, his book, uh, and also I want to mention one of my books, uh, that I wrote about our friendship in general, but also in more specific about uh, our trip together to the US where we attended the National Prayer Breakfast. And it was uh, a book telling uh, how a, a Muslim imam and a Christian theologian both going in this journey to attend a, the, the National Prayer Breakfast and all of the feedback, all of the uh, uh, feelings that I had. And by the way, this trip made us maybe uh, more uh, near to each other 
uh, we were staying in the same hotel for six days. We were uh, traveling together. Uh, it was something that I wanted to document in one of my books. Excellent. 20 years and 20 hours in a plane uh, that that forms friendship. Yeah. <laughs> is, is it <laughs> shoulder to shoulder? <laughs> is is the book written in English? It is translated to English. All right, very good. We'll have to look for that. So, uh, just to add on to that, I wonder when uh, when two friends share their faith. Uh, is it the same thing for you when you come from different faiths to have a friendship experience, to be acting as friends? Is it very similar or is there something different about your relationship because you have faith differences? Maybe Martin would like to say something. <laughs> no, you start this time. If it's a bad question, we'll move on. <laughs> no, it's not a bad question. <laughs> I want to highlight something. Uh, I mentioned before that in my academic study, we never, never took any kind of a training how to build a relation with a non-Muslim in general, a non-Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, or whatever. Uh, but in our daily life in Lebanon, in a city like the place where I live, uh, where we have Christian uh, neighbors, that to live with Christians in the daily life uh, to go to their uh, grocery, to buy something, to meet them in some public pla places. It is uh, something that, uh, very usual, but it is limited. It is the maximum thing that you can have, uh, just uh, meeting someone in your daily life. But with uh, uh, Martin, it became uh, more Let's, let me say complicated. It has some academic uh, thing to do together. It has something uh, personal. It has some uh, family uh, relations and uh, friendship between the wives and children. Then it became a, a mix of wonderful experiences. Uh, and during our conversations, during our formal and informal uh, conversations, many things uh, come to, many theological things, many things related to religion, uh, come to our uh, speeches and to our dialogues. And uh, because of uh, my background as someone living in a city where we have Christian uh, families around us and Christian uh, people living with us, Maybe through Dr. Aqad, I became more aware about the mentality, about the mindset of my Christian neighbors here inside where I live. And uh, through him, I was uh, improving my skills in dealing with the other, speaking with the other, knowing the other in a better way. But, and I can say uh, Martin Aqad is an exception because he has also some, uh, a concrete background about Islam, then when he speaks to me also, I can understand that he knows my mentality. Uh, and this makes uh, it uh, easy for me to communicate with him. And as I said, uh, many uh, uh, outcomes, positive outcomes came from our relation, personal relationship and uh, friendship. What do you think of that, Martin? Um, in, in, uh, in the Christian tradition, uh, I think there are, uh, there's a vast diversity in terms of, uh, uh, people's openness to, uh, reach out and engage in conversation with, uh, individuals of other faiths. For me, it's, uh, it's a central biblical, um, uh, mandate, uh, but also uh, there's a framework for, uh, for engaging with the other that's at the heart of, uh, of uh, our faith tradition, which is the concept of the incarnation. And so the, uh, the idea of going uh, to the other who is different uh, is in some ways modeled on God's way of reaching out to us in our humanity. Uh, 
uh, in the person of Christ. And so uh, this for me is, is quite central to, uh, to, to my faith and to uh, the message of, uh, of the gospel and the Bible. I would say this is the, the central theology that, uh, that I find uh, uh, wanting to follow. Um, it's, it's a theology that motivates us and doesn't allow any walls between us and any group of people uh, to be erected in our society. And uh, unfortunately, not all Christians understand that, and uh, that's the reality of uh, religious traditions. Uh, but uh, I think it's at the heart of the gospel. Yeah, one of the words that uh, Sheikh Mohammed uh, mentioned was complicated. And uh, I think I can understand how our work for peace building and reconciliation, even, even just among Christians or just among Muslims, would be challenging enough. So, you know, it, what is the real motivation to... I guess it is your, your theological perspective, uh, but uh, it just seems like there's enough work to do within the Christian tradition and within the, the Muslim tradition. Uh, why the interfaith? Why is that so important? Well, uh, for, for me, uh, it's, uh, it has, uh, interfaith relations is like a mirror. Um, when you when you engage with someone from a different faith, uh, it puts a mirror before you. It uh, reflects back your own uh, your own reflection. Uh, it helps you purify your faith. Uh, you realize that you cannot use the jargon that you're used to using uh, with uh, with people from your own community. Uh, I cannot be comfortable with the uh, concepts that I'm used to using with people of my faith. And so it forces me to, uh, to a, a, a bit like purifying, you know, the uh, gold until you, you get to the essence of it. Uh, you get rid of the fluff. Uh, it, it makes you realize what really matters about your faith and about God and about your understanding of God. My, my friendship with Sheikh Muhammad has helped me understand God better because uh, I've had to think about it much more deeply, uh, much more to the heart of it. It's helped me understand uh, the place of Jesus because I know that although Jesus is such an important common ground uh, between our faiths, uh, he is also a, a point of uh, disagreement on some of the essential doctrines. And so it's forced me to think, well, how do I express the, what this particular doctrine means to me in a way that perhaps the other person will not necessarily accept, but will understand better than they have understood before. So for instance, even at the beginning of this conversation, I use the concept of the incarnation. Now, the idea that God meets us in a human being is not something very palatable to, to our Muslim friends. I think probably Sheikh Muhammad would agree with me on that. However, uh, for me, I've had to come back to the essence of it. What does it mean? Is it something about, you know, uh, somehow God uh, doing something which is unthinkable philosophically? Or is the heart of the message that we are to go to the other who is different? that we are to identify with the other. It's a message for those of us who live in, in places of conflict and crisis. You know, there are refugees and, uh, that come in our neighborhood. What do we do? Do we stay in our little corner, comfortable, talk to our own people, or do we reach out to them? Do we go to them? That, that's very important for me. And, and uh, it's my interfaith friendships that have helped me go back to the essence of these important uh, concepts in my faith. Well, Sheikh Mohammed, uh, do you have um, much experience helping other Muslims do the same thing with uh, reaching out and having a different perspective? How does that work in the community of, of Muslim people? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sure. Uh, Dr. Martin mentioned that uh, when he teaches at uh, ABTS uh, a class about uh, Islam, uh, one of the things that he 
does he brings his students to my mosque then and it's a big mosque with more than 1000 people attending and just uh, receiving this group of people uh, 10 to 20 individuals uh, having them sitting among the other uh, muslim uh, muslims who are attending the mosque just seeing this group of non muslims at the mosque it means a lot to the people who are in my mosque besides uh, this is the huge crowd the 1000 people who are uh, seeing visitors from a different uh, religious background attending the mosque. But let, let me also talk about uh, the uh, small group of uh, imams and friends who, has, uh, who have trust on me. Sometimes I invite them to attend a, a, a conversation with uh, Dr. Aqad and his uh, students. And also that ha helps them to improve uh, their uh, perspective about the other. The, the same thing that happened uh, to me, and I mentioned it before, then I invite other imams and friends and uh, uh, educated people uh, to uh, witness some kind of a dialogue to have this experience. Then uh, in conclusion, uh, the, the, the scene of a group of non-Muslims attending a mosque uh, does change the, the, the idea, the perspective of the 1,000 uh, prayers in my mosque. And also having this meeting with a small group of Muslims with Dr. Aqad and his uh, students also uh, not only change the perspective, but also uh, improve the, the relation between my colleagues and friends with the other, with the neighbor, with the people who are living in this world. And, and we need to have good relationships with them. Yeah, yeah I, th I think that's, that's very true. But we also have this next question, which I think is, is one of the most challenging questions uh, and probably of great interest to uh, most, uh, at least the Christians who are wondering why, why do we focus so much on the interfaith and, and uh, the challenges of doing that is, uh, is just both, both faiths have this call to spread the message to go and preach the, the gospel or to, uh, to preach to those who are unbelievers. And, and so I wonder what is the dynamic there when we are promoting interfaith contexts and friendship and peace and reconciliation, but also uh, wrestling with that call to, to preach and convert and, uh, and help others see the, the important message that we have to share. What do you think about that? Martin, you want to talk first or Sheikh Mohammed, which one? Yeah, uh, let me start. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, one of uh, the things uh, that uh, is about me in my CV, that I'm a senior judge. Then uh, I'm the head of the family court in my hometown, Sidon. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we do in our court is to receive converted people, the people who had a different religious background and they recently converted to Islam. And by the way, uh, in uh, the past uh, 10 days, uh, I received two of, of them. And usually I will say to these people, uh, guys, Muslims in this uh, world are more than 1.67 billion people. Then we don't need extra people. <laughs> and to be honest with you, maybe we need to eliminate some. <laughs> and people do, do not uh, uh, believe that. The, the, the judge is saying so, that he does not need extra people and also he need to eliminate some. Uh, actually, uh, it is not uh, making the number bigger and bigger. Uh, uh, Islam is not a sect. Islam is not a small religion that it needs more followers. Uh, I think it is a huge nation. And 
if some people want to, to receive the message, they will have many ways to receive this message. And, and especially in these days with the internet and with the social uh, media, then spreading the word in these days is uh, very easy. And those who are seeking to know something and even to convert to new things, they can easily find what they need. Back to what I do in my personal life and in my uh, relationship with Martin and with other people. Uh, it is not uh, preaching and trying to convince and trying to bring people to my religion. No, it is trying to improve myself to be a better person. It is trying to practice the real teachings of Islam that I believe in. And it is a way to uh, uh, practice some verses in the Holy Quran. In the Holy Quran, we can read about uh, dialogue with non-Muslims, and especially uh, the people of the book. And it is uh, the Jewish community and the Christian community. We have verses saying that, let us go to them. And other verses, let us invite them in Arabic, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا Then, come to us. Another verse, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ للناس. You are the people who will go to the Then, it is not uh, bringing extra members. It is going to the other to know him and to let him know us. And at the end of the day, people will have their own uh, uh, decision to make it uh, uh, stop at certain limits or to convert from both sides. And through Dr. Martin, I met some Muslims who convert, converted to become Christians. And I do respect their choice. And as I mentioned before, many come to my court to convert to Islam. And I'm not the one who is encouraging them, but also I need to respect their choice. Then if we believe in uh, the, the uh, freedom of the person uh, to choose what he thinks is better for himself, then we should uh, respect. And uh, I think we uh, make our religion, uh, we, we, we underestimate our uh, religion if we make it like something that is in need to other uh, followers, is in need to new members. I think it is a kind of uh, giving a bad reputation to our religion if we show it in such a way. So Martin, is this, is this the notion of charismatic uh, peace building or teaching? Uh, how does this fit? I think what Sheikh Mohammed said is brilliant. I think it's, uh, it really is the best, uh, you know, it reflects the best of the faith and I think of any faith where you respect the choice of the other while being conscience, conscious of the importance of, uh, of your own and of sharing your own. And yeah, I've referred to that as uh, the kerygmatic approach, which comes from the Greek kerygma, which is proclamation, uh, which I, I explain also as, uh, as a proclamation both in word and deed. It's not just a, a, an oral proclamation. Uh, and I see the charismatic as standing in between other extremes, you know, from syncretism, which is uh, that all, all roads lead to Rome, all the way to polemics, which is an attempt at, uh, at attacking the religion of another community uh, in order to demonstrate that mine is better. And so somewhere in the middle there, there's the gospel, which, as we all know, uh, is... Uh, the, uh, the English rendering of the Greek Evangelion, which is the good news. And so if, if the gospel ceases to be good news, then we've missed something. If it's uh, a message of condemnation uh, that comes out of our mouth, now it doesn't mean the gospel cannot be something that someone feels condemned when they hear it. But if it comes out of my mouth as condemnation, then I've, uh, I'm missing an important part of it. And then the kerygma is a proclamation that focus on, focuses on Christ as good news. It's not about inviting someone to convert out of their religion into mine. It's not about counting heads. 
it's about proclaiming what you believe is uh, is beautiful and like jesus is teaching about the kingdom of god when you uh, when a, a uh, you know someone buys a uh, a, a land and uh, as he is farming it he discovers a treasure he will uh, sell everything that he has in order to uh, to, uh, to to buy that land and so this is what the gospel is it's not about uh, and then the important concept which also meets uh, where Sheikh Muhammad mentioned we do not convert people uh, the Holy Spirit is at work in our hearts and he is the one who turns our hearts to God. And so it is not our job to take someone uh, towards a religion or another. Uh, that Because I have also often said in the uh, understanding of the charismatic that, uh, that Christ's message is supra-religious. It's above any religion it's an invitation into relationship with god and uh, uh, and so i'm when i engage with a muslim in conversation or in friendship or in peace building initiatives i'm not burdened by the constant need to uh, to preach to them in a way that will bring them into out of their religion and into mine that's very far from my thinking but I want to show the best from uh, what I've learned from my tradition in actively engaging in a way that reconciles people between each other and in a way that transforms society. And in the process of this activity, uh, uh, inspire others uh, to be inspired like I am by the model of Jesus. You know, these, these two statements sound very similar. And I wonder if if there are some differences in the way that you engage in this, in the whole work of peacemaking and, and uh, interfaith dialogue, are there differences that uh, would seem maybe that we don't, we don't see on the surface, but they're underlying or are the rules for engaging the other very similar? I have to reiterate that you've just heard uh, the, you know, the most positive expression of this concept from two traditions. And it doesn't mean that everyone in, our, in both our traditions would agree with us or uh, would not have either a much more diluting message or a much more extreme uh, divisive message. Um, but uh, it's, your question is interesting about I, there is also, there are different rules that apply, I think, to different types of engagement, I would say. Uh, you know, you, you don't use the rules of one game and apply them when you're playing another game. And if you'll forgive the analogy of game, we're not playing games, of course, with each other. But uh, what I mean by that is when I'm engaged in dialogue or when I'm engaged in peace building with uh, members of another faith, I am not using this activity as an excuse to try and convert others. And that's a very important question that has to do with authenticity and with honesty. Um, and that, uh, unfortunately, sometimes my core religionists are guilty of. Uh, honesty and transparency are among the most important values uh, in our interfaith relationships. When, when I am engaged in interfaith work, I am engaged in interfaith work. When I'm engaged in peace building, I'm genuinely engaged in peace building. Now, I do it always charismatically in a way that I hope brings glory to God and highlights the values and teaching and the beauty of Christ. But I'm not doing it in a, in a way that is uh, taking advantage of a context in order to uh, to with a, with a hidden agenda, and I think that's very important. On the other hand, this doesn't mean that I will not engage in direct witness to somebody who is interested in learning more about the Christian faith and presenting to them the gospel in a way that would make it uh, um, uh, available to them, that would make it uh, accessible uh, to them. Uh, and there, there are different rules that apply as well. Always ethical, always transparent. But we are not 
all the time using the same tools in every task that we undertake. And we are not always applying the same rules in every game that we play. That makes sense. That's, that's good. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed, uh, this is kind of, we're moving towards our, our Q and A time. Uh, but uh, to this question, uh, do you have the final word? I think the key word is respect. Respect myself, respect my religion, and also respect the other and his choices. I think this key word is the basic thing that we can build on uh, all of the uh, interacting between each other as individuals and as uh, representatives to our communities or at least to some part of our communities. Very good. Thank you so much for responding to these, que these questions. And uh, I hope that uh, we have some questions from our attendees today. And I'll hand it over to Darren to see what uh, questions we might, we might have. All right. Uh, yeah, so there's one question wanting maybe some more uh, a, a fuller picture of what happens when groups, when y'all bring groups together? Um, I think Martin, you talked about that earlier about uh, bringing Christians and Muslims together. I know y'all have a couple of different initiatives that you do that with. Um, but when they come together, what do they, what do you do? And is there a particular theme that you focus on? Or what is the, um, the primary purpose when you actually get, get together? So, uh, yes, uh, I'll give a few examples or, or, or a couple of examples. And uh, these two uh, initiatives that uh, Sheikh Mohammed is well familiar with, one of them is called Khibzumilih, which means bread and salt, uh, which uh, engages uh, young people between the ages of 14 and 17 in various uh, parts of Lebanon. And we, uh, we train them, we equip them, with uh, what we call principles of dialogue. And uh, so, and then we have a very simple curriculum. Uh, they will meet uh, between six and eight sessions. The, the online realities of COVID-19 have changed a little bit the way we do it, but they will engage usually between six and eight times. They will start the first session, for instance, talking about prayer and how they practice prayer in their own life. There will be another session where they talk about, uh, about a conflict. How does their tradition uh, tell them to handle conflict? Uh, that sort of thing. You can actually go to our website, abtslebanon.org, and look under Institute of Middle East Studies and look at our peace building initiatives, and you'll find Khibzumile, and you'll find our curriculum that you can actually use uh, in your own activities with young people. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, resources there for that. Uh, another initiative that I mentioned briefly was the network between uh, faith leaders, also in different parts of Lebanon, and then through them access to churches and mosques and, and communities of faith. And there we've also developed a very simple, uh, we've, we've developed a very simple uh, curriculum or outline typically will meet twice a year, once in a, uh, sorry, four times a year. So uh, uh, in, what, twice in a mosque and twice uh, in a church or in the, uh, in the sort of parish uh, hall equivalent in each. And then we will have, you know, two, two and a half hours where we will share some, uh, some uh, uh, food and, uh, and fellowship. And then we will talk about things. And this network is called the Friendship Network for Church and Mosque Goers. And so the foundation of that is an exploration of the concept of friendship. And three main components that we like to explore are trust and uh, empathy and respect. And we view these as three essential components of friendship, but also of interfaith friendship. And there's a lot of research that shows that empathy is a basic component that we learn as children that helps us uh, uh, identify with the feeling of someone else outside of ourselves. And the more empathy is developed in us, the more we're able to 
uh, have good relationships and, and uh, overcome conflict uh, situations and so on, because we're able to put ourselves in the other person's uh, shoes. And in fact, again, it's the basic uh, idea of behind the incarnation of uh, being like the other, uh, uh, standing in another person's shoes in order to, to experience what they experience and be able to uh, resolve a, a, a relationship and build a true friendship on. These are two examples of, of sort of things that we do together. I'd like to add uh, something. Uh, all of these activities have two dimensions. Uh, what uh, Dr. Aqad mentioned is the first dimension between the Muslims and the Christians. But also there's another dimension which is between Muslims themselves and the Christians themselves. Because these uh, students or individuals who are attending any of these activities, many of them do not know each other from the Muslim. And uh, it is, uh, then it is a, a building a better relation between the Muslim members, between themselves, and the same thing, this is another dimension. Yeah, thank you both. Um, yeah, so here's another question and, and kind of flows from that, possibly, but uh, what are some of the major barriers that you both have found must be overcome for meaningful dialogue? And so maybe not your own barriers, you've been doing this a while, but as you've seen, what are some of the major barriers um, that, that must be dealt with, overcome, um, so that this type of engagement can happen? I would say fear uh, and lack of trust, uh, particularly in a context like Lebanon where sectarianism rules. Um, you are, uh, you're uh, prepared, you're, you're educated, to, uh, to support your own people uh, in opposition to the other. And so the barrier of fear uh, is, uh, is very significant and is something that needs to be overcome. Uh, but also lack of trust because uh, we always are, have the impression that, uh, that the other is saying what they are saying just to uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, look good to us or, or, you know, but that they're hypocrites. What I find, for instance, uh, in, in my own Christian community is that if Muslims uh, do a violent act, then we say, ah, you see, this is what Muslims do and this is what their religion. So, Sheikh Mohammed, why don't you jump in and tell us? Yes. Uh, yes. There are barriers, but I think even uh, it is not because of uh, being a Muslim having a, di a dialogue with the Christian, because even uh, all Lebanese communities have barriers between people from the same uh, religious community. Then uh, life is complicated. Uh, sometimes maybe with your uh, brother or sister, you will find different uh, point of views and uh, different uh, choices and uh, uh, you'll find it very difficult maybe to, to speak with them or to, to convince them or to discuss certain issues with them. And you are talking about members of the same family and uh, the same religion and the same maybe uh, uh, education. Then since barriers are always there between people, uh, this is the, the, the challenge that we want uh, to, to, to face, to step over these barriers and to uh, come nearer to the other and also to invite him to come nearer to us, to reach a win-win situ situation to reach a midpoint where we can meet then. But to be more specific, uh, Martin mentioned uh, fear. Yes, fear is there, but maybe I can add another word, 
uh, being uh, suspicious why they are coming to the mosque. Uh, what do they want to know? Why do, do they want to know uh, about us? And do they have a hidden agenda? That fear and being suspicious towards the other. Maybe this is one of the things that I realized in my mosque. But when it, uh, when it is the first time, it is very clear. But time after time for 15 years, uh, by time, it becomes weaker and weaker and people become uh, more and more open. Yeah, great. Well, let me follow up on that. Um, so just talked about some of the barriers. So I'm curious, um, as you have engaged and particularly have you, as you've taken others um, into these types of interactions, um, and you've gotten them to overcome some of those barriers to actually engage with intentionality. Um, what, what do you find um, that, what surprises people the most once they actually engage at this level? So in El Lebanon, like you said, you see the religious other in the market, but when you actually have real conversation and interaction, what surprises people? Is it, is it something about the faith they didn't know? Is it about the actual experience. What what have you seen that um, is surprising, and especially those things that um, draw people deeper into this type of engagement? Um, I, I find that uh, often people are surprised at how similar to them uh, others are. Uh, often after uh, uh, mosque prayers, you know, Sheikh Muhammad will come back to the to the back of the mosque and. It says, so how was my sermon? And uh, so we will, uh, I'll ask the students, what did you think? And often they'll say, well, I mean, that could have happened in my church or, uh, um, and then, you know, we'll have a conversation about it. So I think what often surprises people is how similar people are. But it does take a few times until people believe that this was not a show until people believe that this was authentic. And so maybe like Sheikh Muhammad mentioned, you know, the first time we come to the mosque, people are, you know, suspicious. What's going on here? Why are they here? And after a while, we, became, we, we become part of the furniture. <laughs> and also I'd like to add, one of the things that surprises people, as I realized from my friends and colleagues who usually I invite to, to, to some of these meetings, they are surprised how easy it is to speak with the other, how easy it is to sit with him, to have some food together, to have some uh, tea or coffee together, to discuss certain things, maybe theological things or personal things. They are surprised. It was like an alien to them uh, someone that we can never have communication with uh, him. And it happened to be that he's a human being, just like us, having the same concerns, having the same problems, having the same ideas about many things, and how easy to communicate with him. If I could add something also, Darren, uh, because students at ABTS come from various countries in the Arab world. And so one thing, and that's maybe a little bit... a uh, a flip side also, and in order not to uh, remain in the ideal. Um, you know, there are students who come, for instance, from Egypt or from uh, parts of North Africa or from uh, Iraq or Sudan will often say, uh, you know, this could not happen uh, in my country. Now, I'm not saying that they're always right, because then later when they graduate, they go to the country, they try, and they're able to do something similar to what they've experienced in Lebanon. But it is true that Lebanon has quite a unique context. And so we mustn't think that relationships between Christians and Muslims are necessarily the same in every country. I think they are improving uh, globally, uh, contrary to what we might think. I think personal relationships are improving. Uh, and I think the more positive we are and the more hospitable we are towards each other at the beginning, the better it is in the long run. And that's kind of my message to people in the West and in, in North America or in, uh, in Europe. Start well, 
uh, and uh, and you'll uh, harvest good fruit in the long term. Yeah, very good. So I'm going to give the last question um, to Sheikh Mohammed because Martin, you're going to be joining us again here in a few weeks, and so you'll get a chance to kind of say a word. But I'm going to ask his last question, um, Sheikh Mohammed. Not everybody on this call lives in in the U.S., but a lot do, and I'm in the U.S., so I'm going to ask this question. Um, what would you like to say to particularly the church, so Christians living in, in the U.S., about um, Islam, about peacemaking and interreligious engagement, anything you'd like to say? What's a word for us? And it can be a word of encouragement. It can be a prophetic word, um, whatever you think is best. But what, what would you um, like to share with, with those of us in the U.S.? Uh, I would make it like a joke. Usually we have in our spoken language, Come to us and you will find what will make you happy. Then <laughs> you are most welcome to my community, to my court, to my mosque. We are uh, open to everyone. You are most welcome. Please come and be sure that uh, the outcome will be very positive. Mm -hmm. It is a, a call to individuals and also to churches. Yeah, that's great. Well, I can say um, from my experience, whether it's coming to Lebanon or being in Palestine or in Thailand or wherever, that one thing uh, I've learned a lot, and I think we can all learn a lot from the Muslim community is hospitality. That idea of welcome, um, I've experienced um, numerous times. Um, so I agree. Thank you for that word. Thank you for the, uh, engaging these questions. Gary? Yes, and I, I let me add my thank you, uh, especially Sheikh Mohammed, uh, for joining us. And I, I hope you felt welcome in this Christian environment. Uh, and we, we do receive you and uh, are very grateful for giving your time uh, to us and having these conversations. Very rich conversation. We are very grateful. And to you, Martin, as well. Uh, thank you, thank you yeah. for uh, uh, joining us and uh, enlightening, enlightening us about some of these very important issues. It's so easy uh, to fall down the road of, of lacking the empathy that you've talked about and lacking the respect that we need for just being human beings, much less uh, people of faith and uh, people of the book. And uh, so we're grateful for the work that you do in peace building and uh, the, the the opportunities you have for making a positive difference in Lebanon. And uh, also, uh, we welcome you to the United States. Anytime you have an opportunity, we, uh, we would welcome you in Abilene, Texas, and enjoy a conversation and, uh, and hospitality with us. And we look forward to maybe one day also seeing you in Lebanon. Uh, so thank you and all. You are most welcome to Lebanon and hopefully, uh, uh, coronavirus will end and uh, traveling to the U.S. Uh, is one of my uh, pleasures. I've been to the U.S. eight times and <laughs> I'm ready to go there at any time, <laughs> hopefully after corona. Very good. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Darren and Gary, for hosting this and thank you to your colleagues uh, who have supported this session. And uh, yes, we, we should have been uh, in there in Abilene, Texas, shouldn't, ha shouldn't we, yeah. both of us? Uh, if it weren't for the travel restrictions. So hopefully another wonderful. year. But isn't it, isn't it wonderful to have the technology that we can still engage this way? Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and I would like to say thank you to all of our attendees. Uh, we have some wonderful conversations coming up. Next week, we'll hear from, from some women, Christian and Muslim, uh, who have uh, done some different kinds of things related to uh, peace building work. And uh, so I hope you'll join us again next week Tuesday at noon, and we'll have more of these uh, conversations. Thanks again for joining us, and uh, we'll see you all next week.